Perfecto, gracias. Adelante, Joaquín. Gracias. Hello, everybody. It's uh, my distinct pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker. Uh, we're continuing our, our talks on, on the Latinx Scan event. Uh, my name is Joaquin Barroso, and today I have the distinct pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Jesus Velasquez. He's from Puerto Rico. Uh, he received his BS degree in chemistry from the University of Puerto Rico. Then he moved to the University at Buffalo in New York, the United States, where he got his PhD. And in 2014, he moved to California, to Caltech, for a postdoctoral uh, research state. Uh, his uh, research is mainly focused on the rational design of well-defined dimensionally reduced materials ranging from monolayers, bilayers, nanocrystalline thin films, and freestanding mesoporous monoliths. These materials uh, have a potential application ranging from nanoelectronics, energy conversion devices, to environmental remediation. Uh, throughout his career, he has been uh, awarded a, a number of prizes, such as the National Science Foundation Career Award and the Cottrell Scholar Award by the RCSA. And this year, uh, Dr. Velasquez was recognized as a member of CNEN's Talent of 12 for his work with the metal calcogens for turning the greenhouse carbon dioxide into methanol. Today, he's going to uh, talk a, a little bit about his research at the University of California in Davis. Um, well, welcome. Thank you very much for, for accepting uh, today's uh, slot. And please, Jesus, take it away. Well, thank you so much for the kind introduction, Joaquin. Eh, eh, para mí es un gran honor este, estar aquí eh, compartiendo. Eh, eh, bueno, un poquito, voy a hablar un poquito de mi jornada eh, brevemente, eh, darle un poquito más de de colorido a, a lo que Joaquín ya les dejó saber. Este, eh, pero, pero estoy bien emocionado y, eh, de poder hablarles a ustedes eh, sobre eh, the type of research that we've been doing at the University of California at Davis. Eh, so the title of my talk, as you can see here, we are thinking about figuring out ways and how to control dimensionality, how to control active sites of uh, specifically multinary calcogenites. We believe that we're just scratching the surface, and uh, you're going to see a, a lot of different details on how we're scratching that surface, uh, no pun intended. Uh, but like Joaquin mentioned, uh, I'm originally from Puerto Rico, and this is where I did my undergraduate, specifically in the University of Puerto Rico at Calle. Uh, but as a kid and, uh, and uh, part of my teen years, I was constantly going from Puerto Rico to New York. Uh, that's actually where I learned my language and where I also learned, uh, where, where actually, uh, excuse me? Okay, sorry. Uh, and where I actually also uh, uh, developed uh, my love uh, for things like salsa and hip hop and all that good stuff. So after I finished my undergraduate at the University of Puerto Rico at Calle, I did what uh, actually undergraduate students here uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the U.S. called a, uh, a gap year. Uh, essentially. So I worked in pharmaceutical industries for actually about four years between Puerto Rico and Florida. And then standardization and operational procedures got me a little bored. And I had a great opportunity to uh, be able to um, get some funding from the NSF Bishop Doctorate Fellowship. And that led me to uh, beautiful Buffalo, New York. I know it's really cold and very snowy, but it was just perfect for me. It was a great fit. In that time, actually, uh, there was also someone beginning his career. His name is uh, Professor Sarbajit Banerjee, who's now in Texas A&M. And I was part of his, force, uh, his first generation of students. So I had the great fortune of creating a lab from the bottom up. For those uh, uh, graduate students or, or, uh, that are beginning in new labs or undergraduates that are, that are thinking about choosing a lab uh, uh, for next year, do not be intimidated by brand new professors. Uh, you know, there is that uh, pioneering opportunity that, that it makes things really unique uh, and really fun. Obviously, there are some challenges. It's not always peaches and cream, but uh, it's all well worth it. So once I finish uh, uh, my doctorate degree with Sarbajit, then I had the opportunity to go to Caltech uh, uh, to work under the supervision of Nate Lewis. But... There was actually a really cool program funded by the DOE that was also beginning 
to open uh, labs. So I had the oppor to opportunity to start a new lab from the bottom up all over again during my postdoc. And that was uh, while we were habilitating the buildings for the Joint Center of Artificial Photosynthesis. So basically in New York, the, my love and passion towards materials began uh, and also um, uh, the know-how of characterizing electronic structure through synchrotron methods. And then in Pasadena is where I, where I actually uh, was introduced to the world of electrochemistry and photoelectrochemistry. I combined both worlds and then I was really fortunate uh, to have had the opportunity to create a research program dedicated in part to energy conversion and storage at the University of California at Davis. So uh, as you can see, now you have sort of a glimpse of what have been my influences. Uh, if you wanna know a little bit more details about uh, how I dealt with adversity and a little bit more information in terms of my journey, make sure to register for the CNN uh, uh, Talented 12 happening next week. You will hear uh, uh, our journeys from, not only from me, but also from Diego Solis, who also actually, uh, I gave his talk yesterday. So yes, we are designing uh, multi-dimensional materials, multi materials that by controlling uh, dimensions or controlling composition, it could allow us to perhaps have some impact on adsorption size for water remediation. So here's some uh, sort of little cartoon showing some initial work that we published uh, just last year on removing crude oil from water, but also looking at the world of energy conversion and how by tuning local coordination through structure, through electronic structure, we uh, should be able to have an area where we could have, uh, where we can impact the interaction of electrochemical interfaces. Today, I'm gonna to focus my talk specifically on the energy conversion side. I'm gonna, the majority of the work that I, that I will present uh, has been developed by my team on CO2 electrocatalysis, but we also uh, have done some studies on hydrogen evolution with uh, the goal of learning some of those structure property functions from hydrogen evolution and begin to implement them, implement them on, potential, on potential CO hydrogenation reactions. So when we're talking about CO2 catalysis, of course, like every uh, application and functionality that we exploit through the materials chemistry world, there are some opportunities and challenges. I'm just gonna talk to you about one, uh, a couple of the main ones. So as you can see here from this diagram, we're talking about a multi-proton electron uh, uh, transfers that we will need for us to be able to successfully convert carbon dioxide either from the atmosphere or either uh, uh, or extractor from flue gas uh, from point sources for us to be able to convert them into small molecules that could be utilized as fuel or, or as commodity chemicals. Now, the challenge there is that one needs to figure out how we're going to fine tune that interaction between key intermediates, like for instance, carbon monoxide or hydrogen and your surface. This is where the Sabatier principle comes into play. It's also uh, known as the, uh, as the Goldilocks principle, where essentially we have to figure out the science principles that gives us the permission for us to optimize the binding strength of adsorbates, where we achieve this sort of optimal point where that binding is not too strong, not too weak, or, but just right. If it's too strong, they will poison your catalyst, doesn't work anymore. If it's too weak, most likely you will produce carbon monoxide, which is also a pretty interesting uh, target molecule, but you, were not, uh, but, but you will be sort of limited on the number of different uh, uh, interesting small molecules that could be produced from something like carbon dioxide. So if you're familiar with this world, uh, the, I would say the, the golden standard of heterogeneous catalysis of CO2 is copper. And for the past five to 10 years, we've seen enormous progress in us, and for us to be able to control how selective uh, is copper at reducing CO2 to something useful. Now, another sort of challenge in this reaction is that we wanna do it in, in environments that are perhaps extremely uh, a sort of ease and inexpensive. So that leads us for us to be, for us to have the golden dream of being able to do CO2 electrocatalysis and aqueous media. Unfortunately, 
where there's water, you're at applied potentials, you're gonna wanna split water. And that is uh, primarily one of the competing reactions that you perhaps have seen in the literature or you're gonna see here with some of the results. Now for a solid state chemist, there is an abundance of, abundance of opportunities. Why? Because we can control solids, we can control the local coordination um, that it could uh, give us some design principles for us to be able to control the reactions. But not only for, uh, it, there's an abundance of opportunity in this field for solid state chemists, but also for electrochemists, because these materials would be the main role players that will be part of our electro constructs. And uh, thanks to the hard work from fo folks like Diego Solis and the world of PV, right? The world of, of perovskites, we know that now electricity is cheap. We can use photovoltaics and actually be able to produce electricity in very inexpensive ways and it's only getting better. So the sort of like overarching idea would be, can we use renewables and resource, renewable electricity generated from electricity or from wind turbines and connect it to a device that allows us to use those electrons for good use? actually trigger redox reactions with some of the key targeted molecules that are also abundant, or even use the energy of the sun to trigger photoelectric catalysis or photocatalysis. That is sort of the, the golden dream. And I think that as, as every year pass by, we get closer and closer. So when we talk about a catalyst, what would we want from one? Um, there are a number of different properties, but if I have to give you three, we would want a catalyst that allows us for us to do small molecule conversion that is selective, that is active, and that is stable. Um, and the good news, or maybe, you know, it may, maybe it's good and bad news, <laughs> is that there is a plethora of properties that we can fine tune in solids and in molecules, uh, at different types of design principles that we could uh, uh, basically fine tune for us to be able to have this trifecta, well, at the very least have two out of three. We will take it if that's what we get. So today I will focus primarily on two, uh, on two of these uh, effects. Uh, one is the presence of surface motifs on solids like defects, um, and also the, uh, the presence, of, uh, presence of promoters, so intercalants within these different frameworks. So the type of, of compounds that we dealt so far, I like to call them specifically uh, the, uh, um, the MO6S8 uh, uh, and MO6S8, sorry, and MO6X6 uh, coordination. I like to call them pseudomolecular extended solids. And we've been able to successfully synthesize these materials uh, to have either three-dimensional or one-dimensional coordination for electrocatalysis, but also We've been inspired, and you'll see why, by 2D materials, by metal calcogenite uh, 2D materials. We use chemical intuition, but we also use the computational uh, uh, power and the data science uh, for, us to be, for, uh, uh, for us to be able to guide synthesis. And something really interesting that we've seen with these materials thus far, at least in theory, is that if we could play or uh, fine tune the stoichiometry of the intercalant, we could actually have a shift of density of states and open up an, and open up a gap and give us the opportunity for us to have an inherently active electrocatalyst that uh, perhaps ha will have light absorption capability and that will lead us to the world of photoelectrochemistry. As I've hinted before, uh, we, we've been able to successfully tune this, uh, uh, these discrete areas within the extended solids, and I will give you all those, these different updates as we go. So we will talk about surface motifs of, of aluminum disulfide. Um, as you can see here from the optical image, uh, depending on the synthesis that you choose, you could uh, uh, control screw this location, edge sites and vacancies on the surface they all have a role to play in the, in the, in, uh, in the electrical uh, catalysis reaction. We will look at these active sites for the Chevrolet phases. So, uh, um, and we will, I will give you a little bit more of our uh, sort of uh, fundamental hypotheses of what we think it's going on uh, while, when, we are, when we have basically all these elements in, in, in the interplay. And then I will give you some uh, preliminary results. Well, actually some published, recently published results on how we can control the growth of these one-dimensional wires and give you a, little, uh, a couple of hints in terms of motivation.
for electrochemical conversion. So let's start with molybdenum disulfide. As you can see here from the SEM, uh, you're seeing these flat areas and, and literally like these steps uh, that I'm showing you here with, uh, with the laser pointer. This is what we call in the community edge sites. And edge sites are nothing more than just dangling bonds, so under coordinated sites. Uh, uh, so if we're talking about molybdenum disulfide, you are going to uh, basically find that the termination of that step edge is going to be a metallic molybdenum. And, it, and they've been uh, highly studied and it's just an explosion of interest for the past couple of decades, but specifically thanks to uh, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the ideas that we've gotten with uh, being able to do a synthesized graphene. Um, we have taken advantage of this layered structure and also to the fact that uh, we could fine tune whether depending on the crystal phase, we could either uh, uh, synthesize a two H uh, semiconducting phase and have narrow band gaps that could be used as photocathodes, or we could uh, actually synthesize a one T molybdenum disulfide metallic phase, we'll, uh, which gives us the opportunity to have a versatile metal surface for electrocatalysis. What I just described, actually this little table here, for us to be able to have a, a, uh, a decent idea of how terraces, which, is, which, are, which are the flat areas uh, and edges, which are these uh, under-coordinated sites, how they react or uh, I should say behave under electrochemical environment and, and, uh, and photoelectrochemical environment. This little table has taken about 10, uh, I wanna say 50 years to put together. Uh, uh, and, and one of the sort of uh, interesting results that we've been able to see thus far is that there's more under coordination that we thought. Uh, the majority of the step edges, which was in the world of photo photoelectrochemistry, the main areas where we think that electron hole recombination was occurring. Therefore, it, 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 you would basically lose uh, minority carriers to do photoelectrochemistry. Uh, now it's also happening in the terraces as I'm showing you here from the scanning tunnel and microscopy images. Uh, these terraces are also uh, plagued with a lot of uh, sulfur vacancies. And um, there's just been great work in both theory and experimental trying to uh, control nucleation of having either or, either or, or both um, for us to be able to then separate either photocatal, uh, basically have surfaces that could do very well photocatalysis or electrocatalysis. Now, if we look at some of the hypotheses that have been generated from theoretical calculations, specifically this is work from Jens Noriskov, surprisingly, the majority of the work from aluminum disulfide has been done in the hydrogen desulfurization and hydrogen evolution reaction. Very little uh, uh, work has, uh, uh, has been done in the past, I would say 10 years on utilizing aluminum disulfides as a CO2 uh, reduction electrocatalyst. And the hypothesis stated by, by Jens is that we could basically uh, break scaling relations that we have with key intermediates if we have another center in which we could basically uh, share the binding of key intermediates like CO and CHO. Uh, there's also some promise that could potentially, by doping some of these materials, uh, we could also selectively uh, uh, impact uh, how the strength of that binding. And this goes back to what I was hinting earlier about having that Goldilocks uh, principle, that saboteur principle uh, uh, of, of, of not too strong, not too weak uh, interactions between your intermediates. So here I'm just showing you some, some of the, I, I wanna say, uh, uh, some of the representative work out there. Like I mentioned, a lot of work on molybdenum disulfide for hydrogen evolution. This is work done by Jaramillo, where basically he just showed that if you increase the number of edges, you basically increase, increase the number of active sites and improve the overpotential required to split water to produce hydrogen. Then there's been a lot of work in the non-aqueous regime. And the reason why there's been a lot of work in the non-aqueous regime is specifically utilizing ionic liquids in, in the electrolyte is because like I mentioned to you earlier on the main challenges, going to a uh, ionic liquid electrolyte allows you to suppress the competing reaction, which is hydrogen evolution. So these are the questions that we had coming in. 
when we uh, 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 embarked in the world of CO2 reduction using molten bisulfide. We wanted to know a little bit uh, uh, under these conditions, under aqueous electrolyte and applied potential, what, what, how edges and terraces will behave basically. So in order for us to be able to do that, we have to be able to synthesize surfaces that gives us that capability. And what you can see here, these are top down uh, transmission electron microscopy images showing you these little sort of like ridges. These are the edges. These are the under-coordinated molybdenum sites. And as you basically increase the thickness of the uh, magnetron sputtered molybdenum film on the generally dope silicon, followed by thermal conversion using H2S, you can control the population of those edges. So here, uh, uh, basically these, what these numbers mean is that we sputtered 30 seconds molybdenum, 120, and subsequently 300 seconds of molybdenum, followed by sulfurization at high temperatures, uh, we can then control the edge population. So we use uh, some of our electro, uh, uh, electroanalytical characterization techniques that we develop in our lab, uh, specifically the way that we do product analysis after we do uh, the electrochemical reaction is by uh, sampling the headspace of the electrochemical uh, uh, of the electrochemical cell using uh, GCD, TCD, and GCFID. And, uh, and then we also sample after electrochemistry, uh, the liquids and we directly inject it to NMR. That gives us a full idea of after running the electrochemical reaction, what are our gaseous, what are the products that have been converted from CO2 both in the gaseous and in the liquid phase. So what do we see? Well, at uh, 23 coulombs and an applied potential of above uh, 0. Uh, 600 millivolts versus RHE, we see something really surprising. And it's actually this triplet here. And that is uh, exactly the location where uh, propanol, where protons from propanol are distinctively uh, present in the NMR. Now, uh, when we saw this, right, we're talking about basically carbon-carbon bonds. So that is even, uh, if you remember my little diagram, the more carbon-carbon bonds you have, most likely the number of uh, proton couple electron transfers needed for you to be able to uh, have that reaction go, it's higher. So it's actually even more difficult for, uh, for one to be able to do this. I think, it, I believe it takes about 18 electrons for you to be able to get to propanol from CO2. So we were really surprised and excited about it. But, you know, we were skeptical. We, we were not sure if indeed this was uh, being produced from our electrode material or if this is some, de some weird decomposition. So we covered our basis. And the way that you do that in the world of CO2 reduction is by using isotopic, iso isotopically labeled uh, CO2 in your electrochemical reaction. So what you're seeing here is C uh, electrochemical conversion of CO2 with, uh, with just uh, uh, CO2, uh, 12 uh, CO2. And then when we actually did the isotopically labeling, I just have to point your attention that when you go to isotopically labeling uh, uh, the conversion of CO2, you're going to see more peaks next to the triplet. That means that you have, your, you have these satellite peaks that are distinctive of having a successful, uh, uh, basically are distinctive of having uh, the CO2 being um, evidence that it's indeed uh, interacting with your surface and converting to CO2. We use other characterization techniques like differential electrochemical uh, mass spectrometry for us to be able to see that indeed we're producing CO2 from the surface. And that makes us feel a little bit more calm of what we were seeing. So we did even more uh, our product distribution and when I label low edge density, that is the top down image SEM that you'll see in the next slide it has a little to no edge sites, a little to no under-coordinated molybdenum sites, and then uh, in versus something that has just a, uh, you know, a high number of edges. And uh, the interesting result here is indeed, we're seeing propanol uh, in the liquid phase, and actually even for the low edge density, so with little to no edges, uh, the Faraday efficiency towards producing uh, propanol uh, from CO2, it's about a close to 1%. Uh, uh, the majority of the partial uh, current, it's being utilized to produce hydrogen evolution, 
But it's still interesting that we are producing propanol when we have a sample that has little to no edges versus a sample that have lots of edges on the surface, right? If you remember the paper that I showed you on, uh, on how do you improve hydrogen evolution reaction by increasing the number of edge sites, this is basically the opposite. So we were excited about this. And then we said, well, is there a way for us to be able to expose a surface that has little to no edges? And we did that by synthesizing, using chemical vapor, tra uh, chemical vapor transport to do classical uh, single crystal, um, single crystal uh, synthesis. Uh, because this is a layer structure, uh, the single crystal, uh, each of the layers within the single crystal are weakly bounded by van der Waals forces. So we could take hints from graphene and do mechanical exfoliation and expose a uh, fresh surface uh, by just using the scotch tape method. So we use scotch tape method to expose as much terraces uh, uh, and, and, and perhaps less edges to the electrochemical environment. And then what you're seeing here is what we call electroplater's tape. That allows us to protect the entire crystal under uh, uh, electrochemical conditions and only expose the area that is uh, within this window, okay? So when we did these experiments, we basically compared a single crystal where we did some microscopy to verify that we indeed have a lot of terraces exposed. Uh, um, and, then, and, and then basically our, our sputtered uh, slash thermal conversion H2S um, thin film on the generally doped silicon. We're still seeing propanol. However, in the single crystals, we do see a bump of Faraday efficiency from 1% of, uh, of converting CO2 to propanol to about four to 5%. So that made us excited uh, that indeed, if we can control this synthesis, if we can control how we are exposing these surface motifs to the electrochemical environment, we will most likely have a surface that allows us to do carbon-carbon coupling reactions, which is rare in our field. But as you can imagine, there's more to it. So we covered our basis and did X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy to validate and make sure that we're not perhaps losing sulfur uh, uh, or just perhaps some weird decomposition is occurring. When you compare high resolution scans of molybdenum versus high resolution scans of sulfur, you don't see much differences. However, uh, depending on how, on how much of that little window of the single crystal that we exposed, we did see the evolution of an H2S peak uh, under, G, uh, under the GCTCD. And, that, uh, and then we further did uh, some uh, high resolution microscopy and we saw, uh, we compared before, electric, before after electrochemistry, we saw that the, at the atomic scale, we're generating more sulfur vacancies. So there is something interesting there uh, in terms of how stable at the applied potentials at the pH in these conditions are these molybdenum disulfide uh, surfaces when we're doing um, uh, CO2 reduction. So do we need the sulfurization to happen? Well, there's a couple of examples out there that talk about this, um, specifically on the hydrogen evolution reaction. It, it, there is some evidence that if you increase the population of sulfur vacancies, you actually uh, also improve the over potential required for you to be able uh, to split water and produce hydrogen or to reduce H plus to H2, I should say. There's also some theoretical evidence, then the arrangement of the vacancies. So if you could have rows, if you can nucleate control on a surface, rows of vacancies or six sac uh, uh, um, basically uh, uh, interconnections of vacancies or patches, you uh, could uh, perhaps have a surface that allows you to do CO hydrogenation to produce methanol. Uh, and also we did a little bit of work changing the target molecule. So basically uh, doing CO reduction and also methane reduction. And indeed we're seeing uh, what could potentially be some interesting product formation from CO2. So for this part of my talk, there is a lot more to do of course, we're figuring out ways and how to perhaps control monolayer growth over centimeter square uh, of molybdenum disulfide uh, that we could then deposit on a conductive substrate and, and have just uh, a deconvoluted way for us to be able to control the surface motif. So just like I showed in, the, in that initial little table, have vacancies or not, or have edge sites or not. 
And hopefully that will give us a little bit more uh, opportunities for us to be able to elucidate the mechanism. We're doing, the, doing this by before and after electrochemistry, uh, characterization use of spectroscopy, but also uh, by doing in situ and operando uh, synchrotron based techniques. So stay tuned, more to come. But that's not the whole uh, picture here. Um, binary 2D metal calcogenides is only, we're only scratching the surface here. I know there, I know, I know, there's been a lot of attention uh, in being able uh, to fine tune the reactivity of these materials. But as you could see here, and actually some of the work that, this is some of the work that Roald Hoffman did back in the days, uh, uh, looking at within these material and composition spaces. You could actually play with non-stoichiometries non between molybdenum and sulfur and go from an extended structure that has these discrete cluster units all the way to you can have an elongated, sort of like a wire, a slab of molybdenums coordinated with sulfurs. And I'll give you a little bit more information uh, about the structure and how and why this is so cool. Now, I will spoil alert the following. The reason why we really was excited about being able to synthesize this kind of coordination controllably and use it to do electrochemical conversion is because it so happens that this slab of molybdenums that you're seeing is, is sort of like uh, a longitudinal molybdenum coordinated here. Um, have, they're in close proximity very similarly as, as copper is. So potentially an interesting uh, a surface for, you, for one to be able to consider carbon carbolinkic reactions. So it, not only do you have these opportunities to play reactivity by just playing with the coordination of molybdenum and sulfur and have these interesting uh, uh, modalities, but you could also in the extended structure create tunnels and opportunities for you to intercalate material or intercalate uh, different elements that will have an impact. And what type of impact it could have? Well, by just introducing the collagen, I already hinted that we could perhaps uh, uh, just give the, these intermediates like carbon monoxide an opportunity to have some interesting bonding configurations that, uh, uh, that it's actually known in our world like the ensemble effect. So by having collagen versus perhaps a monometallic surface, we, perhaps, we, we now have uh, what could potentially be uh, the power of, of controlling whether or not you have a monodentate or a bidentate uh, bonding configuration for energy. Uh, that's just by introducing the collagen. But now when you intercalate an, uh, an element within this framework, then we could talk about pr metal promotion. Uh, and that, what that basically means is we can fine tune the metallic band structure in ways where we could control that, uh, uh, that Sabatier principle, that Goldilocks binding affinity that, that is so important for you to be able to trigger a multi-proton electron transfer reactions. So a little bit about uh, this composition. This is highly known uh, in, the, in the field uh, of chevrolet phases. They've been studied for decades, specifically on the superconductor uh, uh, side of things in terms of applications. And uh, in the, a lot of work done by Arbach and Levi in the multivalent battery world. Um, and you know, I think that like I showed you on the different uh, coordination between molybdenum and sulfur, there's just very versatile and flexible materials. And, and, and basically it starts with a molybdenum that is octahedrally coordinated, that is encapsulated within this nice little cube of calcogens. And then when you look at the extended structure, you create these tunnels where you can in intercalate things like alkali, alkaline, transition, post-transition metals. You can also change the calcogen in the cage, okay? And you could also uh, impact the stoichiometry of the metal intercalant from zero to four. And uh, uh, in recent work that we actually published in JAX, actually I have to update that reference, that we uh, recently published in JAX, uh, thanks to our collaboration with the Musgrave Group, uh, we, are, we have been able to uh, elucidate that there are even more areas in which you can intercalate within this framework. Actually, the site to here shown in magenta, uh, it's, um, we've been able to, utilizing some of the guidance uh, from theory, we, we've been able to uh, synthesize uh, using um, some solid state chemistry. So the reason why we're excited about it, well, the, one of the many reasons is because what you're seeing here is the thermodynamically stable uh, configuration. So what that means is that 
if we are going to screen uh, different types of electrocatalytic reactions uh, uh, by just playing, we could just change the intercalant at will and we won't have much issues uh, with stability. And it's a, it, we're talking about a species that is earth abundant. And again, that if you think about uh, some of the requirements on electrocatalysts, that is, there's just a, uh, a lot of different venues that we could go from here. So going back in terms of this flexibility of composition. So I hinted a little bit about the ensemble effect in the previous, uh, in the previous slide. So here I'm just showing you an idealized cartoon of how the intercalant could perhaps through electrostatic, electrostatic forces change that bonding configuration and perhaps uh, impact uh, uh, reaction trajectories from CO2 but also changing that cocogen cage from something that it's highly electron withdrawing for something that is less electron withdrawing, we could uh, impact the electron localization of, uh, uh, within the molybdenum. And we know, thanks to some of the theory and experiments done, that having that, uh, that the actual, the binding site, it's, it's essentially molybdenum. That is where CO uh, will want to land uh, in, in this environment. So some of the questions that we're, we're thinking about is how, by impacting this uh, molybdenum cocogen uh, coordination, how could that play, uh, have an interplay of two out of those three uh, trifecta that I mentioned in my intro? Uh, of course, we want to elucidate mechanism. And then we want to use chemical intuition, but we also want that to allow theory to guide us for us to be able to develop some descriptors that not only talk about thermodynamic stability of, uh, um, of these solids within the compositions of interest, but also reaction coordinates and trajectories uh, of the reaction. So how do we synthesize these materials? Well, my, uh, my student now, a postdoc at, at, uh, at Stanford, had this little really fancy uh, name, rapid microwave acetyl solid state synthesis. And I mean, folks, this is a, a hot pocket microwave. I, I swear to you, uh, one of my undergraduate students, uh, you know, I gave her the idea. She's like, okay, we could do this. And I just gave her a couple of bucks. She went to Target and got a, a microwave and, and we haven't stopped ever since. Obviously it has been retrofitted for you to be able to have an inert atmosphere in there. Um, and there are some uh, synthetic, uh, um, there, there are some synthetic details that one has to be able to carry out. Uh, but it works really well. And, um, and more importantly, that allows us for us to be, get, to be able to get high purity material, as you can see here from the X-ray diffraction, uh, beautiful faceted polycrystalline material. Um, we have obviously done our homework and, 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 um, and confirmed the bulk composition and the surface composition using EDS XPS, do the refinement to make sure that our, our unit cell parameters uh, match very well with literature. But then, uh, as you know, uh, from my little sort of, uh, you know, a journey, we're gonna, we're gonna eventually get to the world of uh, uh, studying the electronic structure. And we've already began to look at, uh, thanks to the library of synthesized materials, we've been able to look at uh, the different types of, uh, of structural changes that happen uh, once you start intercalating. So the distortion uh, of that, um, of, of, of those uh, octahedrons that are coordinated through sulfur bridges and, and what interplay that could have in terms, of, uh, in terms of reactivity. So we have, we're fortunate to live right down the block uh, from two national laboratories. So I'm extremely thankful for all the uh, education and training that my graduate students have been able to receive by these really talented staff scientists over at the Stanford Linear Accelerator. And the work that they've been able to do there has been inspired by uh, actually one of our collaborators now, David Pennergrass, that showed some very interesting charge transfer that occurs through the intercalant uh, into the unoccupied uh, sulfur 3P all those. What you're seeing here is the molybdenum KH data uh, from all these uh, different Chevrolet phases that have been intercalated with copper, nickel, iron, and we obviously compare with molybdenum foil and with just the binary molybdenum sulfur. Uh, if you look at the pre-edge region, which is the region that I'm highlighting here, 
Uh, little to no action, there's no features there. And it's actually not that surprising. This is just a metallic core that, uh, that it's really uh, just letting you know that indeed uh, we, we've, you know, we, we, we have what we think what we have. Now, when you look at the sulfur K edge, it's a little different. If you, again, focus on the pre-edge region of on those intercalated chevro faces, there are some bumps and bruises there. And of, upon closer look, when you perhaps focus on the, the red X-ray associated with spectroscopy pre-edge region, there is this nice little shoulder here. This shoulder has been ascribed by theoretical work uh, by De David Pendergrass and some of the magnesium intercalation work experimentally, that that is available sulfur 3P states, that once you intercalate something like copper, you depress this feature uh, to have it sort of, you know, have, basically have a smaller shoulder. And actually this feature could be completely disappeared if you uh, completely occupy the, sul the available sulfur 3P. Uh, the available 3P uh, sulfur orbitals. So this is this experimental proof that indeed we have a fingerprint for us to be able to monitor charge transfer from the intercalant, right, into the available uh, sulfur 3P, uh, available 3P sulfur orbitals. So our uh, one of my graduate students, uh, actually from Argentina, Brian Will Bill, said, well, you know what, we could do better. Uh, to try to understand what is going on with this charge transfer. So he did some computational modeling thanks to the collaboration with David Prendergrass at the Foundry. And just these are just initial results showing you how this pre-edge features changing are changing as a function of the coordination of the sulfurs. So what you're seeing here in orange, you see little to no uh, pre-edge feature. Well, that's not surprising because the, the sulfur uh, uh, depicted here in orange are all coordinated by uh, what we like to call bridging sulfurs. Um, however, when you look at the sulfurs here in green, these are what we're calling capping sulfurs. Those sulfurs are under coordinated and we believe that that might be our window of opportunity for us to be able to modulate charge transfer from the intercalant to available uh, uh, two-piece sulfur orbitals and impact the binding uh, uh, strength of the intermediate of interest in close proximity to molybdenum. We've done a lot of theoretical work uh, with, uh, um, with our, our collaborators in, in the Boulder group at, I'm sorry, in the Moscow group at Boulder. And one of the sort of interesting results has been that by changing the intercalant, we are changing the concentration of the production, spoiler alert, of methanol from CO2. So what you're seeing here is sort of like a heat map, give you an idea of how the branching point energy and the Fermi level of these materials can be impacted upon the nature of the intercalant. So in other words, we want to be able to intercalant species like potassium, like sodium and calcium for us to be able to trigger that ensemble effect that I uh, uh, hypothesized earlier. So now we are sort of in that process, as you could see here from the CO2 uh, characterization uh, to control reactivity. Something really interesting was elucidated through the electrochemistry here. What I'm showing you here is the reduction of, uh, of CO2. Uh, and if you look, yes, at the gaseous product, there's a, there's a lot of production of hydrogen. However, when you only focus on the liquid phase, you see only the presence of methanol and formate. However, when you switch from CO2 to carbon monoxide, you only see the production of methanol in the liquid phase. That is sort of really exciting because what it's hinting is that potentially we are circumventing the, uh, the pathway, the oxophilic pathway towards the production of formate. Uh, so to instead uh, uh, favor the, pa the carbophilic pathway towards the production of methanol. So uh, when we saw this, we said, well, um, we might be able to perhaps do a little bit more of digging. Actually, this is something that is ongoing right now in my lab. We said, okay, we changed from CO2 to CO. How about if we basically produce formaldehyde in situ by the depolymerization of power formaldehyde? And indeed, when we do that, we are basically jumping a couple of steps into the steps where we have formaldehyde binding uh, binded to the MO6S8. 
and uh, we see an improved Faraday efficiency. So for formaldehyde, uh, this, uh, this uh, um, CO2 conversion reaction of formaldehyde is again, showing CO2, CO and formaldehyde is perhaps giving us strong evidence that that carbophilic pathway is favored, but it's also saying the following. It's saying that we are heavily limited by the solubility of CO2 and CO, most likely what uh, in the world of engineering is called, we're mass transport limited. And that has taken us to the world of changing uh, the configurations of all electrochemical cells. So we've gone from a static cell, you remember that little cartoon that I showed you uh, on how we're injecting the headspace and the liquid to the GC and to the NMR. We are uh, taking inspiration by our colleague over at uh, the Joint Center of Artificial Photosynthesis to do these really simple flow through electrodes. What this allows us to do is that instead of being inhibited by the solubility of CO2 uh, and, and, and try to just saturate the electrolyte, uh, and then do the electrochemistry by inputting CO2, CO2 is actually being delivered through this quarter inch glass tube and goes right through this porous carbon. So the input of CO2 is much more readily and not being hindered by solubility issues. And some preliminary results are already showing us that if we could just fine tune catalyst loading uh, and CO2 delivery, and also the, uh, uh, the electrochemical environment uh, or the potential applied uh, to some of our catalysts loaded in this porous carbon, we should be able to continue to see improvements. Now there's a little, little blank space here that takes us to the world of MEAs. So these uh, membrane electrode assemblies. And with this, uh, with this configuration, that just allows you to have just vaporized uh, uh, CO2 it directly interacting with your material uh, to a membrane. And, uh, and that's actually ongoing work at the moment uh, to see if indeed this mass transport limitation can be completely circumvented by uh, having an electrochemical configuration that it is more represented on state of the art and that has been built to mitigate uh, issues with uh, mass transport. In terms of the composition, we we know that we're just scratching the surface. So this is work done by, 2000, uh, by uh, Lee and Brookhaven in 2015. It validates the work that uh, the Musgrave group have shown that indeed in, in, in introducing a more electropositive uh, uh, intercalant could give us uh, perhaps the this charge transfer needed for us to be able to have a, a motif that is much more active uh, for CO2 reduction. You know, all this work uh, uh, specifically has been in the synthesis and electrochemistry process has been developed by Jessica Ortiz Rodriguez and by Joseph Perriman. And instead of giving you a list of the library of materials that they've been able to accomplish successfully through hot pocket microwaving, uh, actually, I just changed that name today, uh, I'll just give you some classes. So metal intercalation, substitution of the molybdenum octahedron has been successful as well, changing the collagen has been uh, uh, really, uh, really pivotal um, and, and successfully, um, um, successfully achieved by Jessica. And then also the pseudo uh, chevrolet phase is sort of, sort of these wires that we've been able to successfully synthesize uh, uh, by, by doing some of the work that, um, that Joe has been able to successfully do. Okay, so as I mentioned, we care also about hydrogen evolution because it's the competing reaction. So by changing the calcogen, you see that indeed there are many uh, different uh, um, over potentials that we can improve by just changing the electronegativity and the electron localization. Um, we're not breaking any records in terms of over potential, but we are definitely learning the position of that hydrogen, right? How the oxidation of molybdenum is changing. Um, yeah. Sorry, I, I hate to be that guy. No, don't uh, worry, don't worry. I'll, I'll so, just say this. I'll say this. Uh, I, will, I, I will say that we've been able to, to basically identify a motif that gives us the opportunity for us to control electronic structure in ways that impact uh, uh, charge transfer modalities. Uh, the dimensionality is gonna play a key role. And, and we're actually really excited that we could now have, uh, you know, these pseudo-chevrolet phases at the nano regime. And 
this ensemble and ligand effect, we're just scratching the surface and being able to elucidate it. We have plenty of research uh, of future work talking about inoperandal and ways and how we can control nano dimensions. I only talk to you about the energy conversion side, little to no, uh, uh, but, but please go into the literature and see some of the work that we've done with water remediation. And with that, I just have to thank all the main players uh, and, key, uh, uh, and, and key students. We have a very diverse group. Uh, I like to say we have students all, you know, from Dubai all the way to Argentina uh, and all of our collaborators and funding resources. Thank you again for your attention and, and I'd be happy to answer questions, both in English and in Spanish. Thank you, Jesus. It was a very exciting uh, talk. We have a, just a, enough time for a couple of quick questions. Uh, Diego, please go ahead. Thank you, Jesus. That was a great talk. Um, Thank you, Leo. I, I was curious. Um, I know that both molysulfide and, and the chevro phases are able to intercalate organics in, in it. And I was wondering if, uh, if, if you think it will be interesting to intercalate some organics in order to kind of further expose the active sites and maybe sort of direct the catalysis? That is a beautiful and great question. Actually, there was a paper just published uh, coming from the uh, University of Washington, actually showing a very, um, a, a very facile way to introduce, uh, introduce some, uh, some interesting uh, small molecules. The, it, the, the short answer is I, we've thought about it. Um, just now being able to functionalize to surface, intercalate with small molecules is becoming more and more available since synthetic protocols. Uh, it's actually a territory that I dare to say that has not been explored in the Chevrolet phase uh, composition. And, and think about it, you know, this ensemble effect, the way that we play with electron localization around the active site, we're, it's gonna point, we're coming to a point where, you know, we, we're coming to a point where we might just hit a wall in terms of how we fine tune that binding affinity. So small molecules could be, you know, another level of control. So, so we thought about it and we love that idea. Diego, thank you. Yeah, thanks to you. I think that will be really exciting. I agree. I agree. Thank you. Um, we have just enough time for another quick question, maybe perhaps two very short questions. Not on, not on YouTube either. Okay, so thank you very much, Jesús. Muchas gracias por tu presentación. Muy interesante, muy emocionante. Gracias a todos, de verdad. Y muchas gracias por ser parte de Latinx Ken. Gracias a ustedes por la oportunidad. Estamos gozando. Y a todos los estudiantes, los trabajos están espectaculares. Así que siéntanse bien orgullosos.